I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning again. It is wonderful to be worshiping here with you on this lovely day. So many of you here gathered, music ringing. It's just a beautiful day. We are still in, just to co-locate with you, the season of Epiphany. And it's fitting because what happened in this gospel story is exactly what happened in Capernaum with the people who were there in the synagogue. Once they heard the teaching of Jesus, they had an epiphany. His exercising this demon was as well an incredible feat. It's known by almost all the scholars that the place that is being referenced sits just underneath a fourth century synagogue, right still remaining, at least partially, in that area of Capernaum. It's still there, and it's just feet, probably as far as from here to the back door to Peter's home. My wife Laura and I visited there this summer, and having spent a little bit of time around that area, it is truly sacred ground. This is also one of those places in Mark, starting out in this first chapter, a further revelation of one of my favorite things to say all the time, which is the eschatological inbreaking of God into the world. I love that. The literal breaking in of God. But it actually came 30 years before in a stable in Bethlehem. But once again, once Jesus started speaking and exercising, people realized God was in the world. This was power and authority beyond human knowledge. There was a sense of it that came up out of Jesus' very being, as opposed to those who had knowledge like that of the scribes that are mentioned. These were amazed witnesses, but they were amazed not in disbelief or disagreement, but in an innocent way, a new teaching, a new knowledge, It reminded me of those times after Jesus was crucified when he would come and visit, whether it was the apostles or the two on the road to Emmaus, or even like the shepherds. Suddenly, their eyes were wide open and they understood where this was coming from. Knowledge versus belief or faith is something that Paul references in this passage about dietary laws from Paul. He's he's talking in Corinthians about the knowledgeable or more experienced Christians and the interaction between them and their knowledge of this food and the young or new believers. You see, there was some confusion because if you didn't believe that there were idols and this whole circuitous path, then if it didn't come from an idol, then it wasn't something that couldn't be eaten. A lot of double negatives. Basically, what Paul is trying to get across is if you start getting into that minutia, just stop. Don't confuse new Christians anymore. And it brought me to thinking about how do we connect or share What is, for many of us, a more mature faith and knowledge with people who either do not know about Jesus or who don't believe? Which also begs the question, when are we acting more like a prophet or an apostle and less like the disciples that each and every one of us are called to be? Now... The Deuteronomy passage is a little bit harsh. I don't think God's going to strike us down if we cross over that line. But what often happens, though, is while we may not be struck down, we may lose 
any kind of traction with the people that we're just talking to and confusing. A little bit of advice. Disciples or followers of Jesus, all of you, it's okay to say, I don't know. That is a statement that's okay. You don't have to know everything and explain it to anybody who asks. The differentiator, I would say scribes or false prophets would often say, let me explain. We're not here to do that. Jesus spoke with knowledge and power from his all-knowing and clear authority, and it was recognized easily. But it's important that we remember, while it's not in this passage, those words to the closest and most important members of his following, his future apostles. We just went over it the other week. It was very simple. When they would ask, he would simply say, come and see. Come and see. Follow with me. See for yourselves. Those witnesses to his teaching and his exorcism did not yet know exactly where this was coming from. But it was powerful. And they wanted to see more. They wanted to follow along. The ones that had some knowledge were none of those who were seated specifically in the synagogue. The ones who had the knowledge ahead of time, it was clear, were the demons. Even the demons knew this power and authority and knew exactly who Jesus was. They shouted. They were so clear doesn't come really through, and I wasn't going to scream in the middle of the gospel, but they were shouting at Jesus as they were driven out of the host bodies they were in. Now, it's also important to note in this kind of setup of Jesus speaking into this wisdom and power that it wasn't a bunch of manual actions on the foreheads or moving them around that drove out the demons. It's because Jesus says the word of God needed only speak the word in order to drive out these demons. But what we saw as an after effect, it was stated in the gospel itself, was a violent convulsing outing, followed by this shouting. I'm quite sure you can imagine some of the language that might have accompanied it. But Jesus remained calm. Another place where it reminded me of a scene we'll see later in the Gospels. The winds and the waters of the Sea of Galilee, all of them in the boat, beating against the waves and the wind. The apostles are frightened, and Jesus is asleep in the back. The power that he had was simply to raise his hand and stop the wind and the waters. A simple calling. Mark uses this imagery of exorcism not just as a healing power. There are healing stories throughout all the Gospels. But as an authority and a power yet seen or understood. Jesus also knew that when he did these things it would shake the foundations of the knowledge and the scribes and the leaders throughout the world. It also lends to the fact that Mark, more than anyone else in his gospel, made sure that Jesus constantly cautioned those around him, following him, against telling and, and pushing this story out and telling all about it to people. He cautioned them, don't say anything. If even the demons knew who Jesus was. Jesus knew the word was going to get out fast enough. They didn't need any additional press or anything beyond the actions. Our call as disciples is a call to invite people and to welcome them. 
as simply as come and see. All of you are here, so you've come and you've seen. But those who may not know may have questions, and we may not be able to just say, come and see, and, be en- and end with it. But what we need to do along with that, when we make that inv- invitation, is to be in the places doing the actions disciples do. Do the work of God on behalf of God. For your own faith and your own understanding. And in those cases, it's much easier to say, I am getting ready to deliver food to the homeless, or feed a group of people, or go visit people who are sick, and then invite people to join you. If they ask you why you're doing those things, simply share what is in your heart. My faith teaches me that there are many in need, the poor and the lonely. I feel called to do that. And then pause. See if they have questions. And if they do, if they ask more about St. John's or whatever work you're doing, simply say, come and see and invite them. It may not be to worship. It may be an event. It may be a musical concert. It may be some reason to come into this building or our parish house to do something like we've done in the past, like Rise Against Hunger. But invite them and let them see the good works that I know each and every one of you are doing in the world. It's important that we take this action. And it's important that we use it to invite people and not to preach to people. This inviting and welcome is important. And if the people that you reach out to might need more convincing or have more questions, then the only thing I would add is speak from your heart. Speak from why you do what you do. And be honest. It may not always be exactly as some formula is prescribed. I feed people because it breaks my heart. It may not be just about quoting scripture, but the work that we are called to do isn't always from a line in a gospel. I think another line, if people are pushing it, which I know they will, it's happened to me plenty of times, a simple help that I can offer came in the form of a Christmas gift I got this year. Somebody bought me a hat with simple words on it. And if come and see isn't enough, just simply say, I can't answer or I can't tell you, but I know a guy. Now, I didn't write the gospel, and I'm not talking about myself here. We know the guy is Jesus. I can't, but I know a guy. And that's the invitation to come and see. Leave the convincing and the explaining and the splitting of hairs to the Holy Spirit and to the one who teaches us and holds the words of our faith that is written on our own hearts close to theirs, Jesus. We come to meet him and to learn from him and about him, and share a meal weekly with him, right here. The important thing that we have to remember is to just come and see. I don't know, but I know a guy. Allow the space for God to move, because God will act in those cases. Then sit back and like The crowd in Capernaum, be amazed. Amen.